Can you help me appreciate all the fathers in the house? We just want you to know that we love you. We appreciate the great work, the tenacity of faith, your intentionality in raising the next generation. And we pray that God's grace will continue to abound towards you. Uh, for all of our children in the, uh, in the junior church who have sent their greetings, can we appreciate them and their handlers for all the wonderful videos and all that. And the spoken word today uh, by Victory, uh, Victory or Sars, can we appreciate Victory for that powerful, powerful spoken word. And then this special composition by the Elevation Priest of Praise. Yeah. We thank you on behalf of all the fathers. We thank you for putting that song together for us. Now, before I go into the word, uh, we want to pray for fathers. Um, today, we want to pamper our fathers. Uh, when I asked the pastors why they asked us to dress down today, they said, if you want to be pampered, you should dress down, you know. Uh, but whether you are fully dressed or you are casually dressed like I am, you deserve to be pampered. Can I get a yes for more than me? We deserve the pampering of today, right? Yeah, so for all the women in the house, if you don't have a plan, uh, please make a plan. There's a suggestion on my Instagram page. Yeah. If you don't follow me on Instagram, follow me, and then go and read what I wrote. I, had, I said, what I want for Father's Day is there. A lot of it's about food, but I'm not heavy on food, so... I'm representing a constituency. <laughs> if that request is not personal. It is generational. <laughs> Praise God. Can I make this special request that all of our women and mothers, can you please stand while the men remain seated? Yeah. We want to pray for our men. And I think the people that we are praying for, the fathers, should take a comfortable position seated while all the women you join me as we pray for our men. If a man is close by and you're comfortable to just put your hands on their shoulder, please do that as we pray for them, as we just release God's blessings upon them. If not, you can just stretch forth your hand in the direction of any man that is close to you. Just stretch forth your hand as we pray for them. Uh, um, I want us to start to pronounce the blessing of God. Everyone online, I want you to join in this prayer. Even if you don't have a man close to you, just pray for all the men in your life, all the fathers, everyone who has touched your life, every male figure that has touched your life in one way or the other. They are the ones that these men represent. As you stretch forth your hand towards them, will you speak a blessing? Will you speak grace over them? Will you declare over them that God will continue to preserve them, that they will not be cut short in their prime? That with long life, God will satisfy them and show them his salvation. Will you pray over them today? That every responsibility, divine responsibility that God has placed on them for this generation, they will fulfill it. In the name of Jesus, they will fulfill purpose. They will fulfill destiny. Will you release grace upon them uh, to be providers, protectors, uh, to, to be men of wisdom, men of honor, men of character and integrity, that our God will sustain them that God will continue to shower upon them the wisdom from above. They will not fail. They will not falter. Where other men are falling, they will not fall. In the name of the Lord Jesus, pray over them today. Call them blessed. Speak a blessing of heaven upon them. That God preserves them. That God protects them. That God shields them from evil. That God takes sickness away from the midst of them. In the name of Jesus, that the heavens open over them in a greater dimension this season. Bless the men around you. Bless the men in your life. Bless the fathers who have touched your life in one way or the other. In the precious name of Jesus, we have prayed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending us fathers. Lord, we pray for the fathers in this house and the fathers to be. We ask that you empower them afresh as we celebrate them today for the fulfillment of their destinies. That they will fulfill every measure of your calling upon their lives. That they will understand your divine purpose for fatherhood. That they will enjoy grace to fulfill it in the name of Jesus. 
we ask for them pure wisdom, wisdom from above. The wisdom of this world that corrupts the heart of men shall be far from them. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we decree and declare that their hearts shall be free of bitterness. Their hearts shall be free of violence. In the name of Jesus, whatever hold men down to poverty, uh, to anger, to, to violence, it will not be able to hold these ones down in the name of Jesus. We stand against the spirit of frustration. Whatever is frustrating men in this generation will not be able to touch our men. In the name of Jesus, we'll raise a shield and a covering over our men and our fathers today. We decree and declare that they are divinely protected. In the name of Jesus. Lord, as they go out there as breadwinners for their household, let them meet with your favor. Let your favor answer to them. Let their steps be ordered. We thank you, everlasting Father, and we bless your holy name. Heal the heart of our men. Set them free for the fulfillment of their destiny. Let nothing be able to hold them back. In Jesus' precious name. One more time, can you put your hands together and celebrate our men today? Our fathers, thank you. And I want to say a special thank you to all the women for obliging my request to stand. I know that is unusual, but thank you for your understanding. Uh, I just feel like there's nothing that should be too much for us to do today to celebrate uh, the great men and great fathers and husbands that God has uh, sent to us in this house. Praise God. Let's get into the Word of God as we teach and preach the Word of God today. We're continuing the teaching series, Resilient Faith. We've been teaching on the need for us to trust God to make our faith resilient and not fickle. The Bible says if you fail in the day of adversity, it's because your strength is small. And the strength of our faith is the foundation of our Christian work. And we have described resilient faith in different ways. And we want to describe it in a different way today, especially on this occasion of the celebration of Father's Day. And for everyone joining us online, I want to charge you to take distractions away from you. Uh, um, if you can, uh, sit in one place and focus on the preaching and teaching of God's word at this time. There's a lot of wisdom that I believe God is releasing at this time uh, that you need to interact with. This message is not just for men, it's for all of us, uh, but I'm going to skew it a little bit uh, so that our men can, will be able to you know, juice something more out of it. My contemplation today stems from the fact that men are leaders in the home. And headship or leadership is about visioning and direction. The making of a human being already suggests to us that because God positions all this, I don't know the right word to call it, uh, you know, our eyes, our ears, our nostrils, in the head. That there's a responsibility that's vested on the head to be able to create direction. The reason why my eyes are not on my bombs is that when I see it, I won't be able to see. <laughs> and uh, the head then suggests to us that whatever is the head, whoever has the responsibility to lead also must take responsibility for direction must take responsibility for visioning, for seeing far, for seeing into the future. That's why we've titled this Designing the Future, Faith for Tough Decisions. So in our quest to design the future, the right kind of future that we want for ourselves and for our household, we will often come under situations where we need to make tough decisions. Like I said, it's not just about men. All of us will make very tough decisions. Last midweek, uh, Pastor Joyce, I was teaching, and she mentioned something uh, about the fact that, you know, research has shown, and psychologists said, that the average person will make sometimes close to 35,000 decisions a day. You know, starting from when should I wake up to what's the first thing I should do? Should I put on the light? That's a decision. <laughs> Yeah, 
uh, uh, should I pray before I go brush my teeth, you know, and all, all those kind of things, you know, decisions, decisions. Within a minute sometimes, you have made multiple decisions. A decision to postpone a decision is a decision. <laughs> you know, so we keep making all kinds of decisions. Some mundane decisions, some very important decisions. So our lives are the outcomes or, or uh, uh, the, where we are in life is actually the outcome of the summary of all the decisions that were made. Decisions, we say, determines destiny. Destiny just, just doesn't happen. It's an aggregation of all the decisions that I've been making. And on this special day, we recognize the call of God upon the man to lead, to guide, to protect, to resource, and to love on their families and their households. And this call of God upon our lives predisposes us to serious decision making that we must seek the help of God to be able to make those decisions right. And in the process of making great decisions, we must recognize that it's a faith walk. It's a journey of faith. We make decisions by faith. We have to be willing to walk with God to make great decisions. You know, the scripture says the just shall live by faith. And the just living by faith actually simply means that the just will make decisions by faith. The just will make decisions by faith. Hebrews 10 and 38 says the just shall live by faith. The just shall make decisions by faith. How do we make decisions by faith, especially tough decisions? The Bible is replete with all kinds of examples of people who made decisions by faith who pull through tough choices by faith. And when you check Hebrews 11, where I'm starting from today, which is the all of fame uh, for uh, people who walk by faith in the Old Testament, there's a reckoning there of the fact that some people were recognized for their faith only based on certain decisions they made. Their faith did not raise the dead. Their faith did not, you know, part the Red Sea, but their faith was recognized in this hall of fame just because of tough decisions that they made. Because those tough decisions affected their whole generation. Let's start out from Hebrews 11 and verse number 4. I'll pick a few verses in Hebrews 11. I'm not reading everything. Hebrews 11 and verse number 4. The Bible says, By faith, Abel, Abel, the son of Adam. Abel, by faith, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gift, and through it, he, being dead, still speaks. Abel made a decision by faith to offer a more excellent sacrifice. Brothers, men in this house, men online, I needed to understand something. There are dangerous decisions, decisions with far-reaching effect, like offering God our best, like being a man of honor, a man of righteousness that we need to make we have to make them by faith, not because we are crazy or religious or bigot or whatever you want to call it. It's just an exercise of faith. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice in every jurisdiction, every area where you find yourself, where God plants you, you will always find Cain and Abel. In every office, there are Cain and Abel, men. Some that will stand for something on behalf of God, and some that will just give God something. You know, just, just give God, 
a life of something. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, some, some men, like Abel, will say, no, there will be no adultery, adultery in my life. While some men will say, it's just one of those things. That, those are Cain kind of men. Yeah, just, just give God something. The Bible says God rejected the sacrifice of Cain and accepted the sacrifice of Abel. It's a way of life that we want to make decisions by faith that will predispose God to accepting us consistently and not reject us. Somebody stay here. I jump to verse 7 of the same Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah, being def- divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. This is another man recorded here in this hall of fame as making a decision that prepares the future or prepares for the future of his entire household. By faith, Noah, being warned before time, prepared an ark according to God's description. This ark will be necessary to save his household when the earth will not be able to hold together. When heaven will unleash upon the earth and the heart will not be able to stand. But Noah and his family were able to stand. May God empower you to be able to hold your family together. May God give somebody wisdom here to prepare for the future of your family. Ladies and gentlemen, there will always be raining days. And some of them are still ahead of us. God is counting on all of us, both men and women in this house, and especially the fathers, to be able to build acts that will sustain our household as we go into dangerous terrain. Yeah, as things unfold in our world. Glory be to Jesus. May God find you faithful. I said, may God find you faithful. Or somebody say, better amen. Amen. Verse 8 says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. It's an action of faith where God sometimes calls out a household, calls on the leader of a house to say, move in this direction, do this. And it has to be by faith. Verse, 11 and verse 9 there, by faith he dwelled in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city, which has a foundation, which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. We live in a time where people are yanking off their families and just going to different places. It has to be by faith or it is fake. And it can land you into trouble. If it's by faith, it has to be, there has to be a command. Faith is obeying God's instruction. Hearing and obeying God's instruction. The most important ingredient of faith is a direction, a word from God. And we live in a time where people jump based on excitement without divine direction, without a word of instruction, without a conviction. Some decisions in life are not, you know, flimsy decisions that are made because of a fad or out of fear or because everybody is doing it. They're supposed to be made based on definite instruction, conviction, direction that is coming from the one who knows the future. Somebody stay with me today. That's how we lead as men in our home. We seek God to gain direction. Yeah. You can't sit in a pub or bear parlor and just hear gist. And because of that, you are making a decision. Some people are, decisions are driven right now only based on the WhatsApp groups they belong to. Yeah. You know, every day they are posting things on WhatsApp group and you don't even know the effect that those things are having on your mind. Some people are no longer working by faith. They work by WhatsApp group. Yeah. Because it's what is most dominant posted there that drives your fear, your emotions. 
to the point that you start to make terrible decisions. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. But 17 says, by faith, I jump to 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Let me jump again to verse 23. Another thing there. Another faith action there. Verse 23. Here the Bible is talking about the parents of Moses. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was eating three months by his parents. May God make us like the parents of Moses. Who knows or knew when to hide a child, when to expose a child, when to, how to guide our families because we're taking responsibility uh, based on divine guidance. By faith, verse 23 again, Moses, when he was born, was eating three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command because if they were moved by fear, they would not take that action by faith. When fear comes in, faith goes out. When faith stays, fear is repelled. They took that decision because they refused to be afraid of the king's command. The Bible says here in verse 24, by faith, Moses himself, who was a child that has come out of a lineage of faith, by faith, Moses himself, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So, Moses himself we see the decisions he took not to pick the last name Pharaoh. <laughs> yeah. Not to just stay in the place of comfort. Those are faith-filled decisions. And if you fulfill God's call upon our lives, we must be willing to make those faith-filled decisions. Let me share a few thoughts and then I'll, I'll bring some framework to this discussion. A few thoughts on, you know, this thing about designing the future and uh, working with God by faith. One is that at any given time, your life is an aggregation of the outcomes of your decisions. So while some outcomes have, you know, have, have fully played out, the effect of others are still unfolding. Yeah. Many outcomes are still unfolding. In this service today, we're going to pray against negative outcomes that are yet to unfold. They will not unfold in the name of Jesus. The resilience of my faith is demonstrated by the quality of my decisions and choices, especially when the stakes are high. There are some things I don't need faith for. Yeah. I don't need faith uh, to decide what I, what I wear. <laughs> you know, when you're working from home, do you need to... <laughs> you don't even need to think about it. Just wear something... You know, and just be okay. You know, some people wear shirt and tie with shorts and just sit and just walk from home. Because it's just, you know, there's some things that are not significant. They're not important. But the resilience of my faith is determined by the quality of my decisions when the stakes are high. And also we need to understand that we need the Holy Spirit to discern a big decision that come across as trivia. Yeah. Many a times, people see some decisions that they feel are trivial, but they're actually consequential. That's when you need the Holy Spirit. What do you think? In the book of Genesis, when Esau was about to sell his birthright to Jacob, if only he prayed, Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Help me with this decision. Do you think he will have sold his birthright? Because the Holy Spirit at that time will have given him enough 
on the head and say, this hunger cannot kill you. Relax. Go and make your own food. If you don't eat now, within this hour, you will not die. Because Esau over magnified the hunger. The Bible says he came in weary from the field. And he says he saw his brother's food, red stew of lentil, red stew. And he said, give me a part of this. And his brother said, send me your bad tries. You are the first to come out. And I know you are carrying something. Bring it. Yeah, bring what you are carrying. And the guy looked and said, what is bad right to me, seeing I'm, uh, I'm about to die? Can a full-grown adult die because you skip one meal? Yeah. Sometimes people over magnify a particular temporary situation and they make bad decisions. Because later when Esau will come, when the day of reckoning came, the Bible says he sought the face of Isaac diligently with tears, bitter tears. Bless me. Me too, oh my father. Don't you have any more blessing? Esau said, I gave it all to Jacob. Yeah. Because you couldn't hold yourself together to make that decision. Then it's affecting you now. Anyone who is experiencing anything that's similar to Esau's type of experience, I pray for you today. On this Father's Day, God is turning destinies around. Yeah. The, the negative consequences of decisions of the past will no longer destroy your future. Yeah. Our God, who is the God of mercy, His mercy will prevail over judgment in your life. Yeah. Or oh, somebody say better amen today. Yeah. So we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to help us understand that some decisions are not as trivial. I'm going to get into it in a little bit. Many uh, young men, young ladies, listen to me today. Whether you are here or you are online, I need you to understand the decision on who to marry is never trivial at any time. Even if you are okay, a young man, you are doing well, you don't need anything from anybody, you, God has blessed you, yet a decision on who to marry is not trivial. It's not about the color of the skin. I know you have your specs, but may your specs not... Uh, not speculate your future. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, some, some people just, you know, you say, I have my spec. The person has to be like this, like that. If that's the only thing, that decision is too critical for you to premise it only on your specs. That's what I'm saying. Decisions very insignificance. So it takes wisdom and discernment to properly screen and differentiate decisions. The things that matter most must never be at the mercy of the things that matter least. Priority, we call them. To make better decisions, especially as men in our homes, we must be able to prioritize and understand decisions that are significant and put them aside from decisions that are insignificant. And you know that you have to invest a lot more in the process of making very important decisions. Let's look at something together. The significance of decisions can be differentiated based on certain things. And that's what I want to speak to in the next three to four minutes. The significance of a decision can be differentiated based on one is potential consequences. Potential consequences of that decision. Negative or positive. You see, some people take more time, invest more energy into the decision on their hairstyle than the next course they will take that can give them career progression. Spend the whole weekend thinking about hairstyle and all that. And the thing is that, what's the consequence of this hairstyle to 2025? Yeah, that's just a question. Compared to a decision that can affect the rest of this decade for you. And how things will turn out. And there's a measure of investment that ordinarily should go into that decision-making process. That when you have poured your energy into insignificance... The insignificance of life, you won't even have enough time to invest into that one. 
Is somebody still with me today? So from potential consequences to magnitude and severity of the decision, how many people or things or areas of life will this decision affect? Is somebody still here? Yeah. How many people will it affect? And the areas of life that it will affect? How good or bad can it get? How good or bad can it get? The decision to leave a job, for instance, <laughs> how good or bad can it get? can get really bad. As bad as not having a job for the next two years. Yeah. How good or bad can it get? So it's something that is well thought out, not out of fear, but out of a sense of responsibility. What about duration of the effect? How long this effect may last? My daughters once asked me whether they can get a tattoo. I thought deeply and I said, uh, will you do start with Enna, you know that thing that they do? Uh -huh. uh, is that what they call it? Enna. You know, the one that is, you can remove. So you see what it looks on you, and you see, <laughs> you also try to see, <laughs> apart from what it looks, how it looks on you, is that if you wake up tomorrow and you don't like it, just wash it off, right? But I said, this one, the duration, <laughs> how long-lasting the effect will be, and the last point is reversibility. Can this outcome be easily reversed? You know, I grew up, some people think that tattoo is from the Western world. No, we have always had tattoo here. My grandmother had tattoo in her hand like this. The only thing was that she wrote there the name of my grandfather. And they lived together, both of them, up to 90-something. And they died together. That's a good tattoo. <laughs> yeah. But this one, that a boy just went at you and said, I love you. No commitment. You went to put his name on your back. Yeah. Three months down the line, the guy finds another chick and said, to your tent, O Israel. But you have this tattoo on your back that you will carry forever. Whenever you remove clothes, people will see his name behind you. That's, that's not reversible easily and it's something that lasts forever. And people make emotional decisions on things that are eternal. Or things that have the tendency to last forever. So duration of effect is important. How bad can it get and how long can it be? Reversibility. Can this outcome be easily reversed? It's not always easy to reverse certain decisions. When I sit around the table, I counsel uh, couples who sometimes maybe marriage is threatened and the feeling maybe we should go our separate ways. One of the things I love to do is to help them x-ray the implications of the decision. Uh, I, I show them scripture in Malachi chapter, uh, is it three or four, where the Bible says, uh, God ate divorce because it covers one's garment with violence. Yeah. And I said the effect of divorce is not on God. It's on us. The emotional and physical violence that can come from it. I tell the stories often of a time that a young couple, I mean, a, a, a young uh, guy and a lady were about to get married. And at the time, I, I used to say that uh, people want to get married in the church. Um, after they finish their counseling, I just want to say a, a blessing over them, especially knowing that I'm not able to attend all weddings. So just see me after the service. I say a blessing over you. I may not be around the weekend. You're getting married and all that. I can't be at every expression to conduct weddings. So um, this couple came, and I prayed with them, and as they were about to walk out, this is about five or I mean, maybe six or seven years ago, I said, is there anything? I just, I just felt a bit uncomfortable in my spirit. Is there anything uh, that you guys are grappling with that may require maybe a little more wisdom or prayer? And the young man looked at me and said, Pastor, 
Yes, everything has been paid for. We're okay. I love my wife. The only thing is that I have a personal conflict. My parents are no longer together. They divorced many years ago since I was maybe seven or eight. This guy is now in his late 20s. So over 20 years. He said, I sent my dad the invite for my wedding, informed him about my wedding, carried him along, and he told me one thing. If your mother is going to be there, count me out. The mother told him the same thing. Because the last 20 years, they are still nursing emotional violence towards each other. The brunt of that was coming upon this guy. Yeah. Who knew nothing about their decision to go apart and what separated them. But the guy was a week to his wedding and he was burdened with a conflict. I have to choose who we attend. Because if this one comes, the other one will not come. And if this one should come, the other one will not come. And I ask people, can you play back 20 years time and ask yourself what you want to live with and what you can't live with and what kind of pain you want to inflict on people around you, especially your children, if children are already involved in this relationship. Because sometimes until we pay, play things forward, we don't know the import of our decisions today. May God continue to guide us in the name of Jesus so that our eyes take decisions Decisions on whether you will follow God with your life or not. It's not a flippant decision. It's a decision that you invest a lot into. The other eyes take decisions on marital partner, partnership in business, on education, on your major investment. We live in a day where also it's so easy to be interested in an investment because everybody's trying to pro, uh, protect their future. And with little knowledge, if a man in a home puts his life savings in a direction and the, thing, the bottom falls out, the whole family bears uh, uh, the brunt of that decision. We need to trust God, especially as men in our homes, to guide us. Our social circle, our response to emergency and crisis, are serial decisions that we need to pay attention to this season. A believer cannot lay claim to having resilient faith and absolute trust in God while still making decisions that please only the flesh and are out of alignment with the will of God. Let me tie this all up together. Decision-making template. Let me leave you with this. I'll go through a few of these just to sum everything together, and I'll give a last slide that I want almost everybody here to go with so that we can start, continue to think around this as we trust God, and it also directs how we pray. This is your making template. First one, screen the decision to determine its significance and how much attention it deserves. I'd already given us a template for that screening. Those four things that we described, like reversibility, you know, and all that, we use that to screen. This is a knowledge-based discussion, and everything I'm discussing is rooted in the Word of God. The Bible says Christ has been made unto us the wisdom of God and the power of God. Many people only seek the power. We don't seek the wisdom. So we don't get the full effect of the power because there's no wisdom to back it up. There's no wisdom to back it up. And as men, we cannot continue to live like that. That's what brought Africa to where we are. There's a lot of spiritual power in this continent, but no development because there's no intellectual impute to the way we go about demonstrating the power of God. Its effect is too shallow. Its effect can be deeper than this if we invest more wisdom into what we do, especially as Christians. Glory be to Jesus. So screen the decisions to determine its significance and how much attention it deserves. Do not waste time and energy on decisions of little consequence. You know, um, a, a couple of years ago, uh, the young man, Mark Zuckerberg, found out Facebook 
was returning back to work, I think about three years ago, from paternity leave. And he decided to just show off by ask, uh, making a post on Facebook and saying, I'm going back to work tomorrow. I'm trying to decide what to wear. And then he showed his wardrobe. Uh, if you have that picture, can you show it for me quickly, if you do? Yeah. I thought you have it. Yeah. Please put it on the screen if you do. Yeah. This was what his wardrobe looked like. Mark wears this gray T-shirt all the time, just to simplify his life. There are more high stake decisions that will require more time. So he goes to work in this round neck T-shirt, gray T-shirt, and another gray or black pants. That's all he wears, except he's going to face the U.S. Senate or attending the Grammys. Then he will wear tie. But anything outside of that, you know, sometimes uh, <laughs> uh, we try to impress when we're still coming up. But when God has blessed you, you don't have anybody to impress. Yeah. People receive you the way you are. Mark Zuckerberg remains Mark Zuckerberg, whether he's wearing tie or he's wearing t shirt. So he decides to just simplify his life. The time that some of us invest into looks. And all those things is too much. It's enough to get PhD. Yeah, to get a PhD. When you aggregate the time, yeah, that you invest, you know, some people they open their wardrobe, they will walk away, come back after 30 minutes, and maybe I should wear this. And then they will go away again and come, uh, maybe this one. They can even choose something and then early in the morning they change it again. Yeah. You can simplify your life like this. Let everybody know you are a gray man. And just show up, just pick any of them. The guy was being sarcastic by saying, look, <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm resuming back to work tomorrow. I don't know what to wear. <laughs> Obviously, he's, he's throwing a banter at some of us who over-invest time in what to wear. I haven't said that. I don't mean you shouldn't look good. Please look good. And not everybody is the same. Not all of us will be Mark Zuckerberg. So people like colors. And you like everything to glow and shine. Yeah, just make sure it's growing and shining you into your destiny. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus. <laughs> Get relevant and important information. Relevant and important, don't forget what talking about decision making template. Relevant and important information is, 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 is a winner any day. I would rather you have your statistics right, you've done your research, even if God says go in a different direction, despite the research. But that you don't have any research at all can be a problem. That you have not invested into knowledge about the area in which you want to make a decision. Many people want to get married, you ask them how many books or articles or message they've listened to about relationship, zero. But they know all the musicians, which one won the last award. Some people know more about their club in the English Premiership and individual players than they know about their financial destiny, their own. They don't know anything about money management, but you know all the players in your club. I also follow a good club, so it's not a problem to follow, but balance your life. There are areas that you must invest in getting information and knowledge so that it aids your decision making. Many people want God to work like a magician. I just pray and you just make a way. And sometimes God wants to, it's like, you know, when I go to pray over people's businesses and all that, I tell them after I finish praying, so what's happening here? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? Just to check their level of knowledge so that to encourage them. Because when you anoint something, you are anointing potential to be released. When potential is zero, nothing, nothing will be activated. Yeah. There's nothing you can do to an ignorant person to change their life outside of giving them information, light shining into their heart first. Yeah. So if the anointing will not bring illumination, that is still a problem. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. In Genesis 13, when you read from verse 10, uh, time will not permit me, but you read the story of Lot. Lot. In verse 10, the Bible says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw Sodom and all those places. 
Do you know the truth? Lot did not consider any information about Sodom. He only just saw that Sodom looked good. By verse 13, the Bible says, what Lot did not know was that the people of Sodom were very wicked people. If only he just asked, what kind of people are in Sodom? And they told him they were exceedingly wicked. Maybe he would not have gone in that direction. Just asking questions sometimes. What's happening there? What type of people are there? What's happening in that industry? What's going on there can be a lifesaver in the decision that affects your destiny. At this time, Lot was almost as rich as Abraham. Their herdsmen were fighting. They, 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 you know, they didn't have enough space to hold their wealth, their machinery, everything they had together. But in Sodom, Lot lost everything that he took out of Abraham's house. He left Sodom as a fugitive. And only because Abraham interceded. If not, he himself and his family would have been destroyed there. All the wealth that he took into Sodom perished in Sodom. Because he, 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 he just refusing to ask the question, what kind of people are in Sodom? And they would have told him, wicked people are there. So it's either you go and trust God not to join them, or you don't go at all because the land is big. And Abraham did not say go to Sodom. He said choose. Glory be to Jesus. Consciously and cautiously seek counsel. Consciously and cautiously seek counsel. Proverbs 11 and verse 14. The Bible talks about multitude of counsel. That there's safety, safety, safety. Where there's no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counsel, there's safety. Men, fathers, we are supposed to be protectors of our home. A man, a father in the house must be the one that seeks counsel the most because the stakes are high. Bad, a bad decision can, can, can take your children out of school. Yeah. And you are supposed to be the protector of that home. And the Bible says counsel leads to protection. The safety in the multitude of counsel. But when you see proud men, I don't ask anybody question. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. When there's a problem at home, they say, in this house, we don't discuss our issues outside. <laughs> Anything that we cannot resolve between both of us, let it not be resolved. That's the height of foolishness. Because there will be things that will be bigger than both of you. And that's why God surrounds us sometimes with people who have superior wisdom that can resolve those issues. If you alienate yourself from them, is at your own peril. And that is a manifestation of pride. Nothing more. Pride. Pride. It's pride. Call it a spade a spade. It's pride. Proverbs 30 and verse 20. The Bible says, though the Lord permits you to, 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 to experience the bread of affliction and water of sorrow and all that, I said your teachers shall no longer be eating away from you any longer. That means God expects you to look around and see your teachers, the people who possess the wisdom you need for time. Yeah, we will possess the wisdom that you need. Proverbs 30 and verse 20 and verse 21 talks about you hearing the voice, verse 21, hearing the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Glory be to Jesus. Some right decisions are accompanied by season of temporary discomfort. A season of temporary discomfort. When that happens, don't stop yourself from making those decisions because of temporary discomfort. We're talking about this young template. Some right decisions will be accompanied by a season of temporary discomfort. Hebrews 12 and verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame. Temporary discomfort. Temporary discomfort. But please make your decision despite the temporary discomfort. Be humble enough to make adjustment when superior information is available. Whenever you see superior information, please be humble enough to make adjustment. Whatever adjustment that is needful should be made when you see that superior information or superior uh, uh, wisdom is made available. In many cases, 
Like I said before, pride is what holds people back from being able to align with superior instruction when superior instruction is available. Lastly, never make important decisions when emotions are in high gear. Never make important decisions when emotions are in high gear. Very important. Never make important decisions when emotions are high. All kinds of emotions that we experience. Excitement, anguish, agony, regret, jealousy. These are not emotions that are good for decision making when the stakes are high. When the stakes are high, I trust God to grant me emotional balance. And when I've experienced some measure of emotional balance, then I start to think of the way forward and how to make what decision to, to be made. But when somebody's angry and you make a decision, there's a possibility that your decision will be wrong. I remember once having a colleague who got emotional in the office one day. Something happened. And somebody took him up on a particular task and then he resulted into an argument, you know, a boss, and he got angry because he felt, if not for the fact that they made you manager here, see the way you're talking to me. And he just stormed out of the office, went and uh, sent in his resignation by email, and that was it. But, you know, I was wondering, is this guy okay? Because I know that he just took a loan last month from the organization. Yeah. The loan that he used to pay his house rent. And then all of a sudden, he just resigned like that because he was angry. When his wife got home at night, I think they spoke. And that one spoke sense to his head. So the next day, he wrote the office <laughs> to say he wants to withdraw, he wanted to withdraw his resignation. The only thing is that HR said management has approved the resignation. And that's how he lost that job forever. Yeah, forever. People make rash decisions based on the emotions of the moment. And when they are calm, it leads to regret. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Never make an important decision when the emotions are high. Whether it's good emotion or negative emotion, don't make an important decision when emotions are high. Another place where people display <laughs> that kind of rash emotion is when they attend parties and they just got their salary. The emotion of excitement when the musician is playing. Yeah. People have been known to spread musicians with their children's school fees <laughs> because of the excitement of what's going on as they call your name. But wale pepe rempe. You know, Pastor Boale here. And you just be, you know, you just be spraying the money. In this part of the world, we love to do that, right? But sometimes people are spraying away their children's school fees and their mortgage payments. <laughs> or house rent. <laughs> and before you know it, when all the excitement has died down, then sense returns. And the end of it is regret. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. I said that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. I wanted to put that last slide on the screen, the schematic for the show making template. I want everybody to take a picture of it if you can. Uh, everyone online, screenshot it. Uh, it's just a summary of everything that I've discussed. It's simple and it's rooted in the Word of God. And you can take your time to think about it after now and to just ask yourself, which one of these am I failing on? on this glorious Father's Day for all of our men here, wherever you see that you have a shortcoming, whether you have been making emotional decisions, whether you have not been getting enough information before you make decisions, for the sake of your family, please ask God to help you to balance out in those areas. A lot is at stake. Destiny is at stake. The destiny of your household is at stake. God is counting on you as we are also counting on you and rooting for you that you will not make a mess of the call of God upon your life. That your family will not fail in your hands. That your marriage will not break down. That you will not be locked into a corner in your career destiny. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is somebody blessed today? I said, are you blessed today? If you're blessed, put your hands together celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we stand? Can we stand?
Can we stand all over this place? Everyone online, if you can stand, join us to stand. Just in honor of our God, lift your two hands to Jesus and say, Father, guide my decision making. Guide my decision making. You are the shepherd of my soul. I give you full control. And I ask, Father, that you guide my decision making. As we cross into the second half of this year, may the Lord hold out your steps. In the name of Jesus, lift your voice today and say, Lord, I give you full control of my heart, of my decisions, uh, of my career. I give you full control of my marital destiny. I give you full control. I submit my emotions into your hand. Whatever negative emotion you may be grappling with, this is the time for you to lift it into the hand of God. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him. Every negative emotion comes out of uh, body and load of care. Will you cast them upon him right now? To the end that you may be able to make the right decisions this season. Whatever is working against your capacity for right decision making. Will you put it in the hand of God right now? And just ask him, Father, breathe upon me afresh. Breathe upon my heart afresh. Help me to make the right decisions this season. Somebody pray right now. 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 Everyone online, join in this prayer. Don't be distracted. Just say these words to God. Let Him know, Father, I crave for divine direction. I yield my life into Your hand. Give me signals. Direct me. Bring information my way that will hit my capacity to make better decisions. Send people to me that will be equipped with, with superior wisdom that will help me. Send me new mentors and coaches. Uh, somebody pray to God right now. Give me a new level of self-awareness that I may know where I am in my journey of destiny. I don't want to be stranded. I don't want to lead my family astray. I don't want to be a wrong model to my children. Pray that prayer from your heart right now. 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 Thank you, everlasting Father. In the precious name of Jesus. I want to pray for the category of people as we wind down in this service. One, I want to pray for anyone here. And by the way, next Sunday, we're going to take this discussion a little further. Somebody may be asking, if I've made bad decisions and bad choices, where do I go from there? That's why you should be in the service next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking about don't waste your pain. How to reorder yourself from bad choices and bad decisions so that out of the ashes of failure, success can rise. And I'm looking forward to it myself. I wanted to be a part of it. But right now, I want to pray for anyone who is saying, I've made some bad choices. I need God to help me reorder my ways. I want to pray for somebody who says, I'm living in the consequences of some of my bad choices. Can I trust God with you that according to his word, his mercy will prevail over the judgment of the devil over your life? Glory be to Jesus. Anyone online who may be saying, I'm living with some negative consequences. I want God to reverse them. Or somebody who may be under the influence of the spirit of deception. You can't explain it, but you have been making bad choices because somehow you just realize that you have been deceived. You have been deceived. And it looks like you are attracting the spirit of deception. Whatever may be engineering that, it stops now in the name of Jesus. Anyone who wants to be a part of this prayer, you can choose to put your hand on your head or on your heart uh, as a point of contact as I pray right now. Whatever aspect of what I said uh, uh, strikes a chord with you, just release your faith right now as I pray. Something is going to be turned around. If you have been attracting bad decisions, it's going to stop. If you are living in the cons negative consequence of a bad decision, my God will reverse it. It's mercy. It's unleashed right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray over your sons and daughters. Everyone join to this service. 
under the influence of the spirit of deception. Anyone under a spell. Making bad choices. In the name of Jesus, we speak an end to that spell. We break the hold of lying tongues around you. We destroy every spirit of deception holding sway over your destiny. We cancel their activities. We disallow them. In the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, your word says in James 2 and verse 13, mercy prevail over judgments. Every judgment of the devil based on uh, the the hero of judgment of the past. We stand in agreement of faith with your sons and daughters. We invoke the prerogative of mercy from heaven. And we decree right now by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Mercy prevails over every judgment of the devil. In the name of Jesus. We know our world works with cause and effect. But when mercy steps in, effects can be wiped away. So we declare right now by a stroke of divine mercy and prerogative of mercy, let negative effects be wiped away. Lord, we declare you, you forgive sins, you redeem, and you restore. So we decree right now, redeem and restore in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We wipe out every handwriting of ordinance that is written against anyone here. The mercy of God prevails over every judgment of the devil over your life. And we decree right now that Jesus Christ restores you in the precious name of Jesus. See, in the attitude of prayers with all its bowed while we're all standing, with everyone joining online, can I pray for somebody who may be saying, Pastor, I'm far away from God. I want God to forgive me my sins. I want to be restored back to Christ. Maybe you never said a prayer before to give your life to Christ. One of the greatest decisions that anyone can make is to accept Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want to pray for you right now. And if you have done that before, but you backslid into sin, and you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, I also want to pray for you. Wherever you are in this auditorium, anyone online, if you're online, go to the chat room, or the comment and let us know I'm giving my life to Jesus. If you are right in the room, can you lift your right hand up above your head? Remain where you are, and I'm going to pray for you right where you are. But please identify with this prayer by just lifting your right hand above your head. I want to give my life to Jesus. Or I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Uh, I want to make this all-time important decision. And if you've made it before, but you know, you know that you're backsliding into sin, and you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, please do the same. Just lift your right hand above your head, and I'm going to pray with you right now. Right now. Right now. While all is about, please lift your right hand above your head, and we'll say a prayer together right now. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. Just lift it, lift it to God, not to man, but to God. God's nudging at the door of your heart. Don't hold back. Everyone on the gallery, thank you. Thank you for your hands there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the decisions you're making today. God, who oh, 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 sees in secret, he will reward you openly. I'm still expecting one or two more people. God is touching your heart. Just lift your right hand above your head uh, and, and, and stand. Just lift your right hand above your head and remain standing and God is going to touch your life like never before. Uh, for everyone lifting your hand, can you remain standing while all the other people sit so I can pray for you right where you are. Just remain standing. Uh, if your hands are not up, you can have your seat and I'm going to pray for you for everyone standing right now. With all that's bowed, everyone standing, can you say after me, Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I ask that you forgive me my sins and that you cleanse me from every unrighteousness. Say, I receive you today as my Lord and my personal Savior. Fill my heart with your spirit and give me a new beginning with you from this moment forward. Thank you, Father, for accepting me just the way I am. If your hand is up, I want you to follow our ministers. Ministers, please, there's someone here that you need to quickly reach out to. Uh, follow them out very quickly. Ministers, can you beckon on everyone standing uh, so that they can go with you? We just want to spend a couple of minutes with you, and you will be back uh, with us in the service. Our ministers want to put uh, some documents in your hand, take your details, and just uh, uh, put you uh, in a place where uh, we can, as a 